Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Connect. I'm Pastor Mark. It's so great to have all of you here this morning. Everybody is only half caffeinated. You were expecting to be at the beach all afternoon. You bought extra sunblock this week, and now you're getting a sweater on instead. No, it's so great to have all of you here this morning. Can we say hello to our Framingham campus and our online viewers? So great to have all you guys here with us. You know, we have, I want to make sure that I tell you about a really, really special speaker that we have next Sunday, June 3rd. That is, we have Dino Rizzo, who's the executive director of ARC, the Association of Related Churches. We are a part of ARC, which is this awesome church planting network that has planted over 700 churches like ours, life-giving churches all over the U.S. Dino Rizzo, he speaks, he speaks uh, nationwide. He's everywhere all the time. He's going to be right here at Connect next Sunday. We think that he's perhaps the most significant speaker we've had here in a decade, if not forever. So you'll want to make sure that you hear Dino Rizzo next Sunday. I've heard him before. He's really great. He's really funny. He's on target. Um, and so it's a really special opportunity that we have to have Dino Rizzo with us. So make sure that you spread the word and make sure that you're here for at least two services next week. <laughs> now, um, you know, I, I, again, I said, my name is Pastor Mark. Um, you know, on our staff, we have abbreviations for people. Pastor Derek is PD, and some, some people refer to me as PM or PMAC. Now, I have to explain something to you, and that is, you know, we're in this crazy family series, and so we've tried downstairs in the, in the common to be providing some sort of special sort of family-themed food during this message series, and we do have a very family-themed food today, which is mac and cheese. And Pastor Derek thought it was outrageously funny to call it P-Mac and cheese <laughs> since I was speaking today. <laughs> so when you go down and see the sign, you say, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I get it why they call it P-Mac and cheese. They actually are capable of spelling here at Connect, but it's actually supposed to be a joke. So anyway, so so great to have all of you here today for the conclusion of our Crazy Family series um, where we're talking about the local church today. You know, I grew up going to a church here in Massachusetts. So it was sort of the big white church on the green with a tall steeple. Um, I liked that church as a kid. Uh, I had a lot of fun there. But oftentimes, it seemed to me that I saw people with a scowl on their faces. Either they were just unhappy to be there, felt like it was a place they didn't want to be, uh, or they were worried about the kids running around spilling coffee and juice and crackers and stuff all over the floor. And so I have a picture of what those sorts of people in a church look like right here. They got the frown on, don't they? Well, if that's the way you feel on the inside when you come to church today, I think that I'm going to be able to help you do something important. We're going to help you turn your frown upside down. <laughs> that's our goal for today here at Connect because we're talking about the local church. And I believe that the local church family is a crazy good thing that God created. It was intentional, and he did it with us in mind, and so that's what we're going to be unpacking here at Connect today, and I'm really excited about it. You know, but I think that to do a better job of helping you to really get it, how significant the local church family is, I can put it in a bigger context for you, which we'll do for just a couple minutes before we launch into this, and that is, it's been on my mind as I've been reading my Bible and studying the last year that I, it seems to me that God does... Six big blessings for Christian believers. There are six, is that the right angle? Six big blessings that God does for Christian believers. The sixth of which is the local church. And if you understand it in the context of these other five, then I think unpacking the local church will make even more sense to you. So six things that God does. First is he provides eternity with him in heaven. Obviously, the biggest thing of all that God does, the biggest blessings that God has for people who become Christian believers. And that is, we get this eternity with Him in heaven, this place of, of joy and happiness and pleasure, of, of where everything is perfect, where everything comes together and works the way it's supposed to, where the lion lays down with the lamb, where uh, I'm convinced that I'm going to ride on a lion safely in heaven. We're going to talk to the animals. The, heaven is perfection, and so we have the, he presents to us that opportunity for life. We can choose to reject that and spend eternity separated from God. And the Bible talks about that, and it's a terrible place. And so this is the first big blessing that God gives for people who are Christian believers, eternity with him in heaven. The second is, I don't know, I just call it general blessings. We go through life as a Christian believer. If we don't have our antenna up, we miss 
the little things consistently that God does in our life. The protection that he provides here, the blessing here, the, the person we meet here, the new resources, the new job, the, the protecting us in health. God is constantly doing things for us. We can consider those things to be coincidences or we can not pay attention to them, but I think we're really missing out on God working in our lives because he's working every day in our lives in all sorts of areas. The third big blessing that God gives is joy. You know, joy is different than happiness. Give me a slice of chocolate cheesecake and I'm happy. When the slice is gone, I'm not quite so happy because our emotions go through this roller coaster, right? Joy is different. Joy is something that, that goes throughout our lives as a Christian believer that gives us a stability. It gives us a foundation to ride out the highs and the lows because we have this confidence of God working in our lives and doing good things for us, and this confidence of our future. And, and so joy is different than happiness. And when we have that deep and abiding joy, then we can ride out the tough times much more easily with him. So that's the third big blessing. The fourth big blessing is purpose and meaning. I bet that you know plenty of non-Christians who feel like they are, uh, they're just drifting, they're aimless in life. They don't know why they're here, what they're doing. And, and I can't imagine, honestly, I can't imagine what it would be like to be one of those people. To feel like, why am I here on earth? Oh, I, it's, what is this, is this, I struggle through life and then I die? Why am I here? God gives us purpose and meaning. And we know from the culture around us that there are lots of people who struggle with this. The pop star slash DJ Avicii, do you know that name? Um, the, 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 uh, the millennials know who that is. Um, uh, he was a, a big, big name about five years ago. Was doing 300 concerts a year all around the world. Fame, fortune, money, women, he had it all. And last month, he committed suicide. And he left a suicide note, and he said he struggled with three things. He struggled with thoughts of meaning, life, and happiness. He had everything that our culture says is good, and he didn't have a sense of meaning in life and happiness in his life. God gives us this for Christian believers, and it's massive. Here's the fifth thing, which might catch you off guard a little bit. God gives us margin, or he desires to give us margin in our lives. He does not want us running our lives on the human hamster wheel. Uh, scripture says God created not man for the Sabbath, but for the, the Sabbath for man. He wants us to have margin. He wants us to have space. He wants us to relax. He wants to enjoy the beauty of the creation he's given us and the bodies he's giving us. And he, he wants goodness in our lives in all areas. God does not call us to race, 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 race through life. He wants us to have margin. Often as our culture doesn't say that, does it? It's this huge blessing that God wants us to have. And then that brings us to the sixth one, which is the local church. I'm convinced of this fact, that this piece here is, other than the eternity piece, is just significant as the other five on this list, which is why our big idea for today is the local church family is one of God's greatest blessings. If you're not part of a local church family, if you're out sailing around alone as a Christian believer, you're missing out on something incredibly profound, something that, to match this message series, I think is crazy good what God has done for us. And I'm going to prove this to you by unpacking a passage of Scripture for you, but I need to give us a little foundation for that passage as we move into it. It comes out of the New Testament book of Acts. Um, Acts follows immediately the Gospels. The Gospels it talks about the life and workings of Jesus Christ. And the book of Acts is a time period immediately following that. We see the growth and development of the early church, some new figures coming on the scene. Um, doing an, and, and we just see how uh, um, God interacting with people post the time of Jesus Christ on this earth. One of the people that we see is a man named Saul. Saul was a Jewish believer, a well-educated, um, smart uh, intellectual um, Jewish man who was adamant in defending the Jewish faith from uh, uh, um, being manipulated or being transformed by Christians. Saul said, I know we're waiting for our Messiah, but Jesus is not the one. And he was so angry at Christians that he went around with permission from the high priest, having Christians arrested, thrown in jail, and put to death. That's how strongly Saul felt about Christian believers. And he's based in Jerusalem. 
And now he's going to head north out of Jerusalem to Damascus, the capital of Syria, the longest inhabited city in the world. And he has letters from the high priest to give him permission. When he gets to Damascus, he's going to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. He's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus appears to him, and he does a 180 in his beliefs. And Jesus says, you are my chosen instrument to bring the gospel to people. And so now Jesus is going to use Saul to do these astonishing things. And so that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to look at this text together, and from it we can unpack the power of the local church. Ready for this? So Saul, so he's now in Damascus. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, is it he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. What a completely awesome story that is. When I talk about being a part of the local church family, I need to make sure that we are all sharing a definition. And since I'm the only one talking right now, I get to make the definition for us. So that's what I'm going to do. And that is, so here's what we have for a definition of, sorry, being a part of a local church family. It means a couple things. Attending church, here's something really funny. When we put this together, sometimes we get typos. It was actually not supposed to say attending church on a daily consistent basis. <laughs> If you were here daily, thank you so much for your dedication to this church and the Lord. If you're here on a regular, consistent basis, we would be equally pleased with you. <laughs> so, so that's the first piece, is being a part of a local church family, it means regular, consistent attendance at church. And the second piece it means, too, is participating in the life of a church. You know, when I was growing up, I'm 52 years old, shockingly, when I was growing up, going to, can you, can you believe it? Amen to that. There's a reason I buzz my head, and it's G-R-A-Y, I'll tell you. When I was growing up, going to church regularly meant what? Going every week, unless you're out of town on vacation or something. Now, statistically, going to, a person who considers themselves a regular in church nationally goes 1.8 times per month. Less than half the time, that person views themselves as a regular If you diet less than half of the time, you're likely not as successful as you want to be. If you go to gym, to the gym less than half the time you wanted to, your work in the gym is not going to be successful. Uh, are, are you following this analogy? There's a purpose and a value to going regularly and to not let the culture tell you what regularly is, is stepping up in other things. You know, you brush your teeth regularly, and I bet it's more than 1.8 times per month. So, so embrace the regularity. So now what we're going to do here. So, if, so if that's the case, I want to show you from this passage in Acts what being a regular, consistent part of a church family does for you, okay? This is so incredibly cool. Five blessings of the local church. The first is it creates community. Being a part of the local church, it creates community. Here's what we read here. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now, I've got some nice neighbors. I don't necessarily want to spend several days with them. 
And I, unfortunately, I bet there are a bunch of you that you think about being with your biological family. You're not really thinking that several days of intimate contact with them is, is, is what you want. Maybe you hit that three-day rule and it's time to go back home. But here's the amazing thing. Here in church, we bring people from all different sorts of backgrounds and interests and all these things, put them together, and we're willing to hang out with them, but not just willing, we enjoy it. I'm friends with people in this church that I would not expect I would have been friends with. But there's something goes, that goes on, which is God involving himself. Why? Because we're not just working in the natural when we're here in church, right? We're also working in the supernatural. It's God involving himself in our relationships. We talk about, and it's really the Holy Spirit. You know, theologically, we have the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Where's God the Father right now? He's sitting on his throne. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is sitting at his right hand. God has not abandoned us on earth. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so we talk about the Holy Spirit. Don't think it's some kooky thing. No, it's simply God with us. God has not left us. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. And he's involved in our relationships here. And I can show you the power of relationships or the power of lacking relationships from some very recent studies that came out, okay? Recently, the healthcare company Cigna conducted a nationwide survey of 20,000 people on the topic of connectedness. More than half of the respondents said they always or sometimes feel that no one knows them well. More than half reported that sometimes or always they felt like the people that are around them are not necessarily with them. They're just hanging in the same space, but they're not together. And 40% felt like they lack companionship, their relationships are not meaningful, and that they are isolated from others. That is stunning. That is today in America. It's not exclusive to America. Our friends to the north, the Canadian government, just did a survey of 400,000 Canadians. The research showed that life is significantly less happy in urban areas. And I'll show you why that's significant for our topic. The research explained that city dwellers, they tend to be less happy despite the fact that they have higher incomes, less unemployment, and greater salaries, and higher education. But the research showed that city dwellers oftentimes lack a sense of community. Because why? Because they're more likely to have moved recently and have a reduced sense of belonging. Listen to this one fascinating finding from this massive survey. And it was a, a, a conclusion that they reached about people living in rural areas. Those people living in rural areas, they're happier, and they tend to have a greater participation in a religious community. <laughs> Being involved in a local church, statistically, is proven to make a difference in people's lives. And God tells us that it, make it makes a difference in our lives as well, and he wants to do great things through us. You know, the 21st century is not always easy, is it? There have been a lot of changes. And some of those changes is we are increasingly disconnected from the people around us. Julie and I and our kids, we've moved twice in the last five years. After 20 years in Vermont, we moved to Rehoboth. And we got to Rehoboth, and how many people do we know? Boom, zero. Came down to pastor our church. We had three kids in school, two in high school, one in middle school. And so we got to know people in the church, a couple of our neighbors. And then bit by bit, you start meeting some parents of kids on sports teams that your kids are playing on. You stand on the sidelines, you talk to them a little bit. But then after like four years there, we moved to Upton, and knowing nobody. And now we only have one, our daughter in high school, the, uh, the, the boys have, are grown and older. And so we came to this new community knowing absolutely nobody other than people in this church. That's the reality of what people experience in this country when they move. They don't know anybody. They're coming into a brand new location and they're entirely disconnected. God understands that we as people need connections in our lives. Take a look at this from the, gospel, from, from the book of Genesis in chapter 2, right after all the description of the creation here, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We know he's talking about Eve, but he understands it's not good for the man to be alone here. Relationships matter. And here at Connect, we have a thousand people on the weekend. Four services, two campuses. 
It's so easy for any of you to go in and out, in and out, weeks and weeks and weeks without getting to know anybody in this church. It's a lot of people here, except you all know Lori Dudley at the door who hugs you every time you come in. <laughs> Sorry, Framingham, we've got her. <laughs> and so here's what we do at Connect. We have small groups because we want ways for a big church to feel smaller and more intimate. And just so to make sure you understand about, uh, about Connect groups, actually the topic of Connect groups is secondary to the relationship. We have all sorts of cool topics. But I don't care what topic you're involved with. What I care about is you're hanging with a smaller group of people for a couple of hours every week or every other week for the next eight weeks for our summer semester, which is starting in two weeks. Connect groups make a profound difference in people's lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the topics are not good. There's all sorts of things. I've led plenty of small groups, and I always love the topic. I always think my topic is so good. We just did, I just did one with a bunch of artists and writers. It was really awesome. But ultimately, it was about relationships. That's what Connect does for us. You know, the first time, the first time I led a Connect group here, I would be greeting people at the door, and, I would, and a bunch of people in, the, in, the, in our group hadn't, they weren't really plugged in at church. And they would come in the door of the common, and I would see their eyes sweep the room. And what would they do? They'd spot somebody in our group and walk over to that person and start talking to them. Why? Because they knew them. Now, this is true. I got, this t I got a text like 45 minutes ago. I got to read this. From somebody in that small group two years ago, we, cr we created a text message chat. It lives to this day. A woman in text just sent out this. She says, hey, all, meaning people in our connect group two years ago. Hey, all, hey, all. I know this is last minute, but I need some help of loading some stuff from a truck into my garage this afternoon. She knows these people, and it has survived. That is the power of Connect Group. Isn't that awesome? That, that's because we all need connections in our lives. But, but so here, here's one thing, though. The sun, I get there's all sorts of Sunday morning exp experience that's great and is downloadable. You can get on your, you can pull your podcast out. I love Elevation Worship and Hillsong, and I can listen to their music anywhere. Or I can go live, listen to the biggest name preachers anywhere I want to through the po power of digital media. But this whole service is not a downloadable service. The connections that happen here, the seeing people that can't be replicated. When you come into church in the morning, you're putting yourself in a position where you can encourage and minister to somebody else. You can give them a hug. You can ask them how their week's going. You can ask them, hey, did you get that job that you were interviewing for? Hey, what's going on with your son or your daughter? Hey, did you, uh, uh, I know you're struggling with this person that you work with. How's that working out? You can provide assistance and encouragement and love to those people by coming in on Sunday morning. Sometimes you come in on Sunday morning and you're the one needing to be on the receiving end, right? You're not going to get this, listen to Elevation Worship on your, on your phone again. You need to come in and interact with people and have that relationship and that communication with people. That's part of the beauty and the magic of the local church. And God even tells us this. Look at this out of Hebrews, the New Testament book of Hebrews. And let us, con he's telling us to go to church, ready? And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. He says, get in church and stay in church. It's an important part of the connection you can make. So what does this tell us? The, God's model is to do life together. Don't, don't do life alone. Here at Connect, we provide different ways for you to do life together. We've we got our Sunday morning experiences, and we've got the time down in the common. You can hang in the common. We spent money to create that space because we want you to hang out, go through next steps, and get on, a, get on a team and serve on a team where you get to know people, like the, um, the outreach team that ran, uh, um, sort of organized and coordinated all the stuff for the unsale yesterday. Amazing. They've got, all gotten to know each other, and they love each other. It's awesome. Or join a connect group. All ways that God wants to seek to connect you in, and we want to do that here for you as well. That's the first blessing of the local church, being connected. Isn't that awesome? That's the first blessing of the local church. Here's the second blessing of the local church. It sends out people on mission. Now, when you read this, you might think to yourself, ooh, that sounds scary. That sounds like I'm moving to Africa to live in a grass hut. <laughs> and as I was appropriately corrected downstairs after first service, you know, Mark, 
they have houses in Africa too. And I get that, but I'm just, there's sort of this, this, meant, this mindset that, that at least I've had from the time I was a little kid, being a missionary in Africa meant you were going to go and live in the bush. But here's the thing. The door of Connect is wide open. It's wide open to welcome you in and other people in to come and learn about Jesus, to get in relationship to each other, to grow and deepen in your, in your pursuit of God. And it's also open for us all to go out the door understanding that we're heading in the mission field. I used to be in a church that had a sign right over the door, and you could only see it when you were leaving, and it said, you are now entering the mission field, because the mission field is all around us. We don't have to go halfway around the world to be on the mission field. You know, the, um, because what? The mission field is our next door neighbor. It's the sports, club, the sports teams we play on or the clubs we're involved with. is people we see on the sidelines at our kids' events. It's all different sorts of people that we interact with on a daily basis. That's our mission field. And your mission field is different than my mission field. And all we're doing is we just need to love on people and encourage them and point them towards Jesus. 150 years ago in the U.S., 150 years ago, around the world, the U.S. was considered to be the primary sender of missionaries into the world. We were the senders. We were the producers. They went everywhere from the U.S. Now listen to how the Assemblies of God Church describes America today. America is one of the world's great mission fields that the church has been called to reach in this generation. Can you believe that? We're now viewed in America as a mission field where people are sending, other countries are sending missionaries to us because they understand the disconnectedness that is going on here. As people, as Christians, we're called to do two things. We're called to go deeper in discipleship, which is pursuing God, learning about Him, walking on our faith in Him, and and we're called to go wider in terms of evangelism and missions. It's what all Christian believers are called to do, to reach the spiritually lost around us and to get serious and growing deeper personally in our walk with God. Because look at this amazing thing. Not what I was expecting. Let's keep going here. Because I just glossed right over that before. Look, at he told them, the harvest plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus doesn't tell us where the harvest is. He's just telling us it's there. It's all around us, and he wants us to be engaging with it. God wants to use you and I for this purpose. You don't have to be a trained evangelist to have somebody over for dinner. Say, hey, how's it going? To, to say, you know, listen, I go to this great church. Why don't you come on with me? We don't have to be anybody special to do that, and God calls all of us to participate in this thing of calling people into His service. You know, I want to back up in my slide there just a minute because I want to make sure that I see that you see this piece about, about the missions because I just glossed right over it. In Acts, we see that Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. The church sends people out on mission. You see that? He hangs with them, and out he goes. And so from there, we'll keep going, which brings us to our third point, is the, what, the third thing that the local church does, it equips people. The third thing the local church does, it equips people, and it's powerful. Reading in Acts, he told them, oh, sorry, it equips people. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? A little farther here. Among those who call on his name, and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. It's amazing. The Bible doesn't tell us for those several days that Saul was hanging around with his disciples. It doesn't tell us what they were talking about at all but he's hanging around with them. Saul's really smart. As a Pharisee, he would likely have several Old Testament books memorized completely. And so he would understand what the prophets had said about the fact that there was a promised Messiah. Saul just didn't think it was Jesus. So the disciples start proving to him that it is. And Saul is synthesizing all this information with this tremendous Old Testament Torah knowledge that he has. Oh, I get it. Now I can go tell people. And it, it was so clear for him, it says here, 
so powerful that he baffled them by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. His words were so clear. He was so strong with what he did. Why? Because he had been equipped to do it. Now, here at Connect, we desire to be equipping you as well. And I think that we equip you in three different ways. The first way that we equip you is on Sunday mornings. You come in the church and you get this time. You get 35 minutes of a message. But at one level, let's be real. The, the Bible has 1,189 chapters. Divide that by 52 and we've got a problem, don't we? <laughs> if we're going to fully equip you with the, with the full, the richness of God's Word, there's only so much that any church can do over the course of the year. And we know there's some things we always want to be talking about. We've got to talk about money because money is so powerful and so important. We've got to get right with God about money and how we look about money. We want to talk about the Holy Spirit, God with us. We want to help on relationships and other pieces. And so that means that there's a tremendous amount that can't be covered on a Sunday morning. So we can do that first piece, but the second piece is up to you. You all have to be, just like I am, a self-feeder. You have to say, I'm going to dig in on this. I want to learn about what God's Word says. Um, because, because the local church is not able to do it all on Sunday mornings. And so you have to be a self-feeder so you can embrace the richness of God's Word. A couple years ago, I read the Bible through in a year. I would always wanted to do it. I never had quite been successful doing it. And I was determined, and I did it. You have to average three and a quarter chapters a day to get through the Bible in a year. It's very doable with dedication. Fall behind a little bit. It's like, whoa, I've got to read 10 chapters the next two days to like get myself caught back up because th these things happen. But there's this richness you understand, and you're not digging quite as deep, but you, you're getting the, big, the bigger storyline in an amazing way. I have to be a self-feeder, and you all do too. And of course, we have endless information at our fingertips, any question we have, right? But that's the third piece too for equipping you. Uh, um, we're ready to answer your questions. People send me emails. They call me. They send me texts. Hey, uh, Pastor Mark, can you explain this thing to me? Uh, I love to do that. Why? Because it, it means that somebody is like self-feeding, and they got hung up on something. I can remember before I was a pastor, calling my pastor and saying, hey, Neil, I can't remember what's out of, uh, uh, out of Joshua or something. I don't get this piece. He says, Joshua's coming along, and there was an angel standing in the, with a sword before him on the road, and he says, are you for us or are you against us? And he says, neither. I said, I don't get it. And my pastor, Neil, said to me, that's because you're an American. You expect everybody to be for you. He was God's. He wasn't yours. I'm like, oh, it was this simple explanation that made so much sense. Those are the same sorts of questions we get. There's a guy in our church who was I had to travel out of state because he had a loved one passing away who was terminally ill this week. And so I'd given him some coaching on the phone about how to have conversations. And then I sent him a couple text messages. I said, hey, so-and-so, this is Pastor Mark. My next text will be a link to a YouTube video. It does a great job of depicting what I was talking to you about, responding to the, but I'm a good person mindset. That was text number one. Text number two was simply a YouTube link that I sent him. And text three was a summary of a couple things we talked about. I said, all four Gospels describe the thief on the cross. Here's a good one, Luke 23, 39 to 43. Combine that with John 3, 16, blessings, Pastor Mark. So there's different ways we can equip. When we, it's our job as a local church to equip you. You can also be equipped in connect groups where you get to dig in and other people. It doesn't have to be pastors equipping you. We can all help equipping, equip each other. That's what the local church does. And equipping, the last point about this, equipping is not just informational it's motivational as well. It encourages us. Yes, I'm going to do this because it's so awesome. I'm going to dig in or, uh, or I'm going to go reach my neighbors. And now I have a little bit of an idea of what to do. So that's the third way that God blesses us through the local church. The fourth way is that the local church provides for us protection. Read this text. It's awesome. Watch this. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. How cool is that? I would love to lower somebody outside my window in a basket to save their life. I've looked at my house. I don't have a man-sized basket. You know, is this awesome? Are we awake here? This is completely awesome. This is what the local church does. They protect us all. In other parts of the world right now, this sorts of stuff still goes on today, where Christians have to watch out for each other so they don't get arrested and put in jail and killed. 
because the world is not all so safe for Christians like it is in America. You know, there are other ways that the local church in America is helping to protect us. And what that is, we do things like we provide marriage and financial counseling. We can provide some financial assistance. We provide prayer assistance. You know, every, after every service, we have people up front here available to pray for people. We have connection cards where people get to write on. And all of you can write on your prayer request and put it back there. You're prayed for during the week. How awesome is it to have somebody going to our Father with your prayer concerns, with your concerns during the week? Oftentimes, the needs that are met uh, uh, and the protection that's provided is not staff to the church. It's people within the church to each other. You know, we just had the on sale, which was so great, and lots of people donated things to it, um, and lots of people got to, like, empty out their closets. I know for Julie and I, we gave, I tried, I literally tried on every single shirt in my closet and gave so much stuff away, and it's so relief. Now, I walk up to my closet, and I know any shirt I pull out is going to fit. It's awesome. <laughs> and, but we gave away clothing and books and toys and all this stuff and brought it here. But I was also blessed by people here in the church because I came home with a chair and two books. I came home with a Far Side comic book. Anybody know the Far Side? I love Gary. I don't know who gave it, but thank you so much for blessing me with a Gary Larson book because I love the Far Side so much. And then with five kids, we, we read, we were in the 10,000 book club, not that we own. We went to the library that many times to read books to our kids. And one of our favorite series was the Berenstein Bears. Do you know the Berenstein Bears? Awesome. And so we've long ago given away all of our Berenstein Bears books. But Julie comes up to me at the on sale. She says, Mark, look, it's the Berenstein's, Berenstein Bears Get the Gimmies. And we brought Get the Gimmies home with us so that we can read a Bee Bear book at home. So thank you if you're the one that brought the Bee Bear book in. But that's what the local church can do. What the, the last church I pastored, there was this older couple in the church with somewhat limited mobility, and they were awesome, humble servants of the Lord. They were not well off financially. They sacrificed in a lot of ways to help other people. And finally, the church said, you know what? They could use our help. And there was one Saturday, about 40 people from the church came, went to their house, painting, recarpeting, fixing holes in the roof, landscaping. There was this massive one-day group, and we weren't even Amish. We came, and we did this, and it transformed that. It was the most amazing thing. So the church can do that for people today. The church protects and provides for each other if what? If it's functioning properly. And God tells us to do this, and it's so biblical. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Galatians 6, 10 from the New Testament. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The majority of our benevolence, of our good deeds, of our efforts are about taking care of each other. That's the local, that's the local church family. Isn't that great? So that's the fourth blessing that God gives to us. And the fifth is the local church provides encouragement and support. Let's take a look at this for Saul. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple because of his history, right? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. That is so great. You know, aren't there times when you wish you had somebody in your corner? Somebody would help you out. Somebody would help you over the hump. Somebody who would come alongside you in your time of need. That's what the local church, when it's operating correctly, does. You know, in addition to this, the standard needs of, of food, clothing, and shelter that we all need, psychologists tell us that there's something more that we need beyond that. Ready for this? There are three basic needs of all people. To be needed, to be known, and to make a difference. The local church provides the venue for all of this, doesn't it? You know, if you're cycling around and you haven't been in a connect group, all you have to do is get in a connect group and you'll be known. Get on the dream team and start serving and you'll be needed. You think to yourself, this is so great. I can bless people in the church and outside of the church and I can make a difference and I'll feel it inside here. That's why oftentimes we get ready to serve and we think, oh, I don't want to do this. We get done serving and we say, 
That was great. You know, not all the time, but most of the time, isn't it? There's something about service that's absolutely amazing because we get to make a difference. We know we've made a difference in people's lives. So let me just wrap up with, with this. We know from Scripture that the local church is one of the greatest blessings that God gives to Christian believers. It's amazing, isn't it? If that's the case, shouldn't we all dig in, root in, get connected? If you're not in a local church, we would love to have you as a part of our family because we think we can bless you, and I think we'll, that you'll bless us as well. And if you're not a part here, you need, you need to get rooted in somewhere into a local church because it's God's, one of God's uh, uh, venues for making a profound difference in your life. Speaking for the pastors here, uh, um, I want to see God bless you abundantly. And I want you to have the best life in your relationship with Christ that you can. And the local church is one of the components of that. And I hope this is clear as we unpack this, of the power that that is. Orbiting around church, popping in and out, ah, that doesn't do it, does it? We've got to root in, we've got to dig in, we've got to make ourselves a regular, consistent, active, participating part of the church to reap the benefits that God wants to give us. Now, if you've, it may be that I've taken a half step too far for you because it may be that you've never gotten into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You're thinking, yeah, I, I see this. I see the benefits of it, but I feel like I'm on the outside. I'm telling you that God has the door wide open for you because we're all sinners. We all do things that are bad from the time we're little kids. You know, we don't have to teach little kids to be bad, do we? <laughs> we do it on our own because of our nature. We do bad things as we continue to go. The Bible calls all that stuff sin. And that sin separates us from God. It opens this chasm between us and God. And there's no way that our good deeds can bridge that gap. We need something else, which is why God sent a Savior for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross taking all the punishment of my sins and your sins upon himself so that if we acknowledge him, if we thank him for doing that, we say, Jesus, I want you to be my God, be my Lord, then our sins are forgiven and we're made right with God. Our Father looks at us and says, wow, look at that sinless person because of his faith in Christ. You can have that. You can have your relationship with God fixed through Jesus Christ right now. It's not the magic words. We can say, I'm going to guide you through in a prayer in a minute. But you can do that. And it starts you on this grand trajectory of a developing a deeper relationship with God and this awesome promise, promise of eternity with Him in heaven. So if you'd all stand to your feet right now, I just want to provide an opportunity for people to respond on this thing. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you a chance to respond. If everybody would bow your heads and close your eyes, let's give some privacy to the folks around us, okay? If that's you this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you say, I want it. That's what I want. I want you to slip up your hand good and high so I can see it in this lighting. So just slip up your hand good and high so I can see if If you're wanting to get right with Jesus right now, I see your hand, sir. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see your hand, ma'am. Thank you so much. I see your hand. That's so awesome. The Bible says the angels in rejoicing are in heaven rejoice when a person gives their life to Jesus. All right, church, let's all pray together with those who raised their hands this morning. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. I've done wrong, but I want to be right with you. Forgive my sins and help me to live your way, not mine. Thank you for loving me and help me to dig into the local church. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much.